Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself so you can kind of understand where this has all evolved from. I, um, I was a confused undergraduate who found myself as an English major because that's how many credits I had accumulated. I was like, oh, look, I guess I'm an English major. <laughs> and then I didn't know what to do, so I walked into the Department of English office and I said, hey, I'm kind of interested in becoming a teacher, and you have this MATE program, and, uh, and so I'd like to know if I can apply for that, what's the process? This is my first lesson in administration. The ladies, the secretaries in the office, they were women, said, oh, you don't want to do that because the guy who ran that program, he just died, and we don't know how he ran it. So always cross-train so that the person with the information doesn't die and leave you not knowing how to run a program. But so I reluctantly said, okay, they said, just do the MA. Just go ahead and start the master's and the MA in English. So I started the MA in English. And the first thing that you do is they offer you an assistantship to teach freshman composition. So I started teaching writing. And I, had, I never felt like I learned how to write. I just happened to be a decent writer. And so nobody ever gave me much feedback on writing or much help, except they did have one undergraduate professor who said, if you're going to go on to graduate school, you better get your acting gear with these he was talking about mechanical stuff. So anyway, um, I was teaching writing, and uh, I was more fascinated by the writing pedagogy that I was learning in order to be teaching English 1010 than I was by the literature classes I was taking. <laughs> and I dropped out. Um, and I went to work for the National Council of Teachers of English. And they, at that time, had the Eric Clearing House for Reading and Communication Skills. And in that, in that job, I was an abstract or indexer. So I read journals cover to cover, wrote abstracts and index and, wrote, and assigned indexing terms to go into the Eric database. And I began to read about literacy. Liter sorry, I've lost my words. Um, literacy, not literary, literacy acquisition among young children. And I happened to have access to a three-and-a-half, four-year-old at the time, who's now my 35-year-old stepdaughter. And it was fascinating to go home and play and do things with her and see all the light bulbs turn on. And one of the things we did was write together, writing as a way to learn to read. So I ended up being uh, an elementary teacher through various channels. I, did, I ended up getting a master's degree in education, certification as an elementary teacher, and I spent 13 years teaching elementary school. And my favorite thing to teach was writing. And my dissertation was on first and second graders writing and reading informational texts. And so I've, <laughs> I've had kids write in all the disciplines. They were just eight years old when they did it. Um, I now, of course, teach uh, in my program, I teach writing methods for future elementary teachers. I call it how to teach writing without making the children cry. And um, I also work a lot with graduate students and faculty on their writing. So one of the things that I sort of discovered through my work, but also through reading the literature over the years, is that we need to do this thing called scaffolding. We need to provide supports. I didn't get those supports when I was a young writer. Maybe I did, but I, I wasn't aware of them. I didn't get much in the way of anything except a decent grades. So, so when we give students a scaffold, we, it's sort of like putting training wheels on a bicycle. We give them some temporary supports so that they can get going, and then we'll eventually take those supports off. And the, the scaffolding metaphor comes from uh, the idea of a scaffold on a building. but So I'm hoping to give you some ideas today about how to support student writing in your discipline, whatever your discipline is. Automotives, English, third graders, <laughs> whatever it is. And as they understand those genres of writing in your discipline, and they inquire into the features of those genres, 
they see you model how to write in those genres, they have opportunities to collaborate with other writers, then they're going to be ready to write independently. So I, tell me your first name again. Shanna. Shanna uh, learned about my Imsky model, so I wrote it up here. So basically, this is something that I've written about and I've used with children and I use it with my elementary, future elementary teachers, that if you begin with the kids, the learners, however old they are, by inquiring into the genre, what are the features of this genre, whatever it is, and also inquiring into the topic, so they've got to know something about automotive electronics in order to write, and then you either model writing for them or you provide some models of writing, and we'll get into that. Then you do some shared writing with them, which is where you kind of write it together. So you're maybe the scribe, and they're telling you what to write, and you're also providing ideas. That's the shared writing. The collaborative writing is where two students are writing together, so then they support each other. If you do these steps before you ever ask them to write independently, they're much more likely to be successful, especially if it's the first time they've ever been asked to do that kind of writing. And that's often the case. I mean, we all, I invented a genre for my class this fall. It's called the resource. I didn't really invent it, but I'm asking them to build a set of resources and I have certain expectations. It's kind of like an annotated bibliography, but not really, so I'm not calling it that. I've got to do it with them so they can see what I'm expecting. And we'll do some together. I'll, I'll go through some of these steps. If it's something they've written a hundred times before, obviously you don't need to go through all these things. They've written how I spent my summer vacation, a five paragraph essay, a bajillion times. They probably have a decent understanding of that and you could skip right to independent writing. But what we tend to do when we have writing assignments is, I liken it to, well, when I was little, we, I grew up in Tennessee, and we, have, we actually have cement ponds in Tennessee. And we were in this state park, and my dad threw me in this pool, this cement pond, all shady, very, very cold water. Yes, I did have an orange life vest on, but it was super cold and he was standing on the side of the pool, and he threw me in, and I screamed, which was not something I was ever encouraged to do as a child. And he stood on the side and said, relax, which is what I think we often do with our students. We, we throw them right into the pool, and we yell at them to relax. And we don't give them an orange life jacket. We don't give them, we don't even get in the pool with them and blow bubbles with them, or hold them while they float. We just yell. Why can't you write? How come you don't know what a sentence is? <laughs> so we don't want to yell at our students from the side of the pool. So I'm hoping you'll understand the value of worked examples, which is another way to talk about modeling, and rubrics to support students. So there are some threshold concepts in writing studies. The two most important ones I've underlined up there, that writing is a social and rhetorical activity. So when we say it's a rhetorical activity, that means we have, there is a purpose in your discipline for the writing, even if the purpose is just to learn. There's a purpose, and there's an audience, and there's the writer. And if the audience is always you, the teacher, that's not very motivating, because it's very intimidating to write for the teacher. The teacher obviously knows the answers. Why am I writing to the teacher? So having a better audience. So this, this morning, um, Kendall was talking about uh, giving some examples of giving students better context. Like, so you're trying to explain to your friends the difference between operant conditioning and classical conditioning. So she's giving them a context. So that at least there's a pretend audience that's somebody other than the teacher. But when they can write for each other, that helps or you're talking about them writing for this profession. So even my second graders, I told them, well, when we write about science, when scientists write about science, they go to these conferences and they share their writing with each other. 
So we're going to share our writing, our science writing with each other. We're going to have a seminar. And we talked that way so that they felt like they were sharing their knowledge with each other the same way that adults do. Writing also speaks to situations through recognizable forms. So that is to say we have forms such as the essay or the lab report or the literature review or the annotated bibliography. And when we confuse some of these terms, like my husband was taking a class and the people who were teaching the class kept calling this thing that they wanted them to do an annotated bibliography, but it was actually a literature review. So that was strange. Um, and then when they showed them a model of what they meant, it was definitely a literature review, but they kept calling it that. But they are recognizable forms, so whatever those forms are. And I'm going to be asking you to think about what those forms of writing are in your discipline. Your discipline also has particular identities and ideologies that are embedded in that kind of writing that your discipline does. Historians write differently from other people. It's tedious, <laughs> but they write differently. All writers have more to learn. When you were 18, you were a terrible writer too. Just remember that. And writing is always a cognitive activity. So we only have so much cognition to go around. And sometimes what happens when a writer is encountering a new kind of writing, they have to spend a lot more of their cognitive uh, RAM their brain power, thinking about that new genre. And sometimes the grammar, mechanics, the surface features go by the wayside for a minute. It's sort of like when children develop sometimes, like they learn how to walk and then they forget how to do something else because they've taken this giant leap developmentally to do something new and then something else regresses for a while. That's the same thing that happens with writers. And when we're trying to write in a new genre or we're new writers in an academic discipline and we feel like frauds, then sometimes we overreach and it starts to sound really bad. We have this inflated, gaseous language that because we're trying to sound like, well, there's a wonderful cartoon from, from Calvin and Hobbes about that. But <laughs> so just remember that we're all beginning writers at some point when we face a new genre. For example, I sometimes talk about if somebody had you write um, a, an insurance adjuster's report, would you know how to do that? I mean, it's probably a worksheet, let's face it, but let's pretend it's not. What would we put in an insurance adjuster's report if we've never even seen one? We would need to know what are the features of an insurance adjuster's report, and then we could deconstruct that and maybe build ourselves a template and then we would have some idea of how to write in that genre. So the other thing is that research tells us that students come into your classes with lots of writing experience, but it's not necessarily the writing experience that's going to set them up for success in your class, in your discipline. Also, because that doesn't always transfer. So my friend Sharla, who taught high school English for years and years. I said, okay, Sharla, what did they mostly write in high school English when you were doing writing, teaching high school English? Well, they wrote a lot of personal essays, a lot of five paragraph themes, a lot of five paragraph arguments, and some sort of beginner types of literary analysis. That's, not, that's what an English teacher's job is. English has its own content. English teacher's job is not to teach them how to write those other genres in those other disciplines. So they have this experience. So I want to know what kind of writing do you expect and assign in your course? It could be those big writing assignments that are kind of at the end of the semester. Or it could be writing along the way. If you could just jot down one of those, and then if you just want to shout it out or don't even jot it down, just speak up. Let me hear what you have to write. What you have your students write, I should say. I do business communication classes. So we do like memos or inner office memos or things of that nature. What are the features of an inner office memo? What do you want them to know how to do in that genre? So a lot of it is learn how to, you know, who you're writing it to, 
all the templates and knowing the different kinds, what information you want in there. Who's writing? Who you writing it to? Concise of what it is, and then things we. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> so get to the point right away. Yeah. This is not a. You're not here to tell a long, windy narrative. Right. Know who you're writing it to, and maybe what kind of background they might already have on this topic, yeah. and probably put it in some order that's logical so that it has a kind of a logic chain to it, okay? Who you want, what you want, and what you expect them to want. Oh, yeah. So you, now you're getting into nitty-gritty, okay? <laughs> What's another example? Literary analysis. What do we really expect in a literary analysis? So you want them to make textual references. So you want them to have examples from the text that they're analyzing. So that's something that you know, that was never shown to me. It was just sort of like you seem in in the English class were sort of expected to know that already. Yes, right. Okay. Yes, Shanna. Lab reports. Okay. So, right, actually, as a starting place. Uh, table or graph summarizing your data. Uh huh. Right? Hypothesis, prediction, right? Summary of results and your conclusion. Okay. So, and, and if they have never written a lab report, or other than maybe like a really cookbook one in high school, and they've never even seen one that's at the level that you're expecting in a college class, it's going to be helpful for them to see one and to maybe deconstruct one together in class first. Let's look at this. Why does it work? You can also give non-examples. Why does this one not work? What's missing? And have them compare so that they can see what the potential pitfalls are. And we'll talk about the modeling. So let it, any one more example of writing? Yes. Lesson plans. Well, I'm going to come to that. Okay. So I'm going to talk about lesson plans because that's a genre I have to teach. So we talk about worked examples, or they talk, they, I should say, talk about worked examples a lot in math, science, and technical fields. I had a teacher, Mr. Peeler, who had, in my ninth grade uh, math teacher, and he had one of those uh, overhead projectors with the scroll thing. It would scroll both ways. And it would take him all day, but he would use up the entire scroll because he was modeling the whole time. He was doing worked examples. And I remember that he would do a whole example first, and then, and he would talk out loud while he did it. And we were watching him. The room was dark, we didn't fall asleep. He was good. And then he would do another example and he'd stop partway through. And then, and he would say, now copy what I have and finish it. So he was doing what we call a worked example. And as you take away chunks of the example, you are building independence towards being able to do that. So uh, this is something that they call worked examples. We can obviously use worked examples for our writing assignments. So you might have model texts by experts. We're not all going to write George Orwell's How to Shoot an Elephant. That's probably not a great model text to always show because it's too good. But we can still show some model text by experts as, you know, aspirational kinds of models. Model texts written by prior students are really helpful because that gives students a sense of, oh, this is achievable. But I'm here to advocate for model texts that you've written. Because I have this thing, too, like, I should not do unto others what I am not willing to do unto myself. Right? Sometimes I think that uh, we expect things of our students and we haven't lived through them ourselves. And then when they struggle with them, we don't have the requisite empathy that we need for that struggle. 
And so if we do them ourselves, then we can perhaps at least uh, get the empathy that it's hard, that it's going to take a while. But we may also see our lack of clarity on our instructions. We might see how our rubric is not so great because it's too vague. Um, other kinds of pitfalls that we may be able to tweak if we do it ourselves. And I'm all about the Food Network way, too. Because my last one is where you write it on, you write in front of the students, right? But then you can always whip out the finished version. Oh, I've got this lasagna right here in the oven, <laughs> right? So you can have the act of writing in front of your students, but also have the finished product. So I, I have like a million versions of this one thing I used to do with my second graders because I would, <laughs> I would reuse it a lot. Um, so I want to try that with you here. It, I'm going. To, this is a very short one, but it's one I use with doctoral students. So, in, and it's not a particularly. It's not really a genre of writing, but it's kind of a way to write a problem statement for a research paper. So um, it goes like this. Although, nevertheless because. So it's basically three sentences. So I'm going to think aloud while I write this in front of you, and then I'm going to invite you to write one of your own in your discipline. So, although we know that teachers benefit from learning about, mm, this is not great writing, um, assessment, how to write lesson plans, um, classroom management, blah, blah, blah. We know, we also know that, and I could be more precise about this, we know that teachers who've gone through formal preparation to become teachers tend to stay in the classroom longer than those who have not. So, although we know all these things, so this is sort of my statement of the literature. This is what we know. It's kind of my lit review. And I would obviously, in a longer piece, flesh that out. But okay. So although we know these things, nevertheless, the state of Utah has opted to give, and Oklahoma, and they're not the only ones, and other states, have opted to give people with a bachelor's degree a teaching license without any preparation. Are giving licenses to teach to those who have not been prepared, to those with a bachelor's degree. So no pedagogy preparation. If I had more time, I could write this better. I could even talk about mechanical things, too. I could say, well, you notice I put a comma after nevertheless, because that's an introductory word, right? I could do things like that. I also have one after this one. Um, and in my class, I teach about a wubis, all those words that start with although and 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 that are introductory phrases. So you could go into mechanics if you wanted to, OK? Oh, this isn't supposed to be because. Sorry. It's supposed to be therefore. Therefore, and this is the statement of uh, the research question. Therefore, my study will look at how new teachers without preparation cope in the classroom. <laughs> new teachers without traditional preparation cope, and I could be more specific and should be more specific, cope with or manage or I'll say how they assess student learning. Assess student learning. Okay? So this is an example of me writing in front of you and trying to think out loud. It didn't take too much time because it's a fairly 
compact form of writing. So I'd like for you to take a minute and just, and you don't have to finish it, but just kind of jot one down that thinks about your field. So it could be something like, although third graders are really cute, nevertheless, <laughs> they need to learn more Spanish. <laughs> Therefore, I am going to look at ways to increase their Spanish knowledge. That was bad, bad example. Oh, thank you. All right. Too much storytelling. thinking about automotives, and this could work for yours, because I can think, although the customer presented me with a car that did X, Y, and Z, <laughs> nevertheless, it didn't do Y. <laughs> Therefore, I'm going to test to see if Z is the problem. <laughs> I think this could be useful in, in different contexts, but does anybody have one they want to share? It's okay if you don't. Oh, thank you. See, and you got that because in there, too, which is a, a nuance that I decided not to use, but that's good. And then you might have a therefore. Therefore, I'm going to look at the body of this writer's work for this kind of influence, right? Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So why do we want to use work examples? There's a whole body of research on cognitive load. So when we use work examples, we reduce the cognitive load for our students. We take some piece of the burden off. I often think of this with kids also when they're learning to read. You know how, I don't know how many of you wanted to read every Nancy Drew book, and maybe I'm showing my age, but I wanted to read every Nancy Drew book because once I knew those characters, that piece of the cognitive load was taken care of, and I could focus on the plot. So it's a similar idea. This is why we're all enthralled with series on TV. You know, I don't have the cognitive capacity to learn the characters in Game of Thrones. <laughs> so I'm just not going to do it. But there are other things where I do, uh, but I keep watching the series because I can focus on the other elements of it. I don't have to remember so-and-so's name and all that stuff. That's, that's cognitive load in our real every day. We also do lots of other things to reduce our cognitive load using our phones and all of our devices, even post-it notes are a way that we reduce cognitive load. So we also want to use work examples because it shows your students what your discipline expects. What does your discipline expect from them as writers? What do those um, genres, what do they like? Or what kind of habits of mind are expected in your discipline? analytical habits of mind, whatever it is. And the research evidence supports the use of worked examples, especially with novices or low knowledge learners. So the more advanced our students get in a particular field, the less this is necessary. But for me, working with doctoral students, they've never written a dissertation before, and they're never going to write one again. It's a very weird genre. <laughs> so we talk a lot about what's that look like. And Books like this give us nice little checklists to go through. So what should be in chapter one? What should be in chapter two? You know, with, of course, flexibility of mind when looking at checklists like that. Um, I've kind of said all this. Um, as students do become more skilled with the writing tasks that we expect, we can remove all that support. But we should never remove the support that all writers need, which is 
a reader who cares about what they've written, who cares about the content, who's reading it and expecting to make meaning from it. So we want our students deserve responsive readers who provide meaningful feedback and correction sometimes. And that's not always us, the teacher. Sometimes that's other people, or it's all of us together. Yes? Um, I had a unique situation the last couple years. I thought of international students in Audemars and Paris who his native language was Chinese, and uh, he learned English and integrated here. So then he was learning all these new words in automotive, and uh, he would, when he read the textbook, he read every textbook word for word, and he would read them, and he would sometimes have to translate them to Chinese in order to understand them, and he would come to me and say, this is the wrong word, you used the wrong word there. And I'm like, he did use the wrong word. <laughs> and he, you know, he found all these errors in the textbook, he said, this does not mean this. Uh -huh. and, and so we sent all these corrections in, and uh, it was Close reading, yes. Oh, there's nothing like a second language learner to be a close reader, I think, sometimes. Um, so I will just talk really quickly about some examples that I use. The, the lesson plan is a weird genre that we face in teacher preparation. And so it really lends itself to this kind of worked example thing where you first you provide a full example of, that exemplifies all the criteria you want. Then you provide a partial worked example that has an element or two. So one of my colleagues does this. She provides them a whole science lesson, but she leaves off the assessment. So their first job is to figure out how would you assess whether or not students have learned the content in this lesson. And then she provides them less and less of the lesson plan until they are writing one that is completely chosen, where they've picked the topic, they've picked the standards and the objectives. So whenever you can work backward like that, um, in research courses, the statement of the problem is more than just what I did on the board. It's a whole, perhaps, the whole first chapter of a dissertation. But again, you can take those elements and break it down and, and provide, say, a lit review, even if it's a brief one, and then ask the students, what could a research question be based on this lit review? And there are, there's more than one right answer, obviously. So again, you're helping them see that their research question needs to depend upon the lit review, right? Sometimes I think that they have their research question, and then, of course, they backfill the lit review, and they don't always match. <laughs> so that's another way that you can use it. And obviously, in, uh, Shanna uses it in biology for lab reports. In these less defined di disciplines, we're, we might be looking for other kinds of outcomes, such as habits of mind, analytic thinking, or using textual support to support an argument. Maybe you're really big on thesis statements, and you really want them to have an awesome thesis statement. So you should write one in front of them, I think. <laughs> Whatever that thing is that you really value, and Kendall was saying earlier, we were talking about how you can't value everything the first time. You're going to have to pick your battles. So if, you, if the thesis statement is the thing you really want them to master, then you can't pick them to death about every other piece of it. You have to say, this is what I'm going to focus on. And then rubrics are very helpful because then you're able to show them what the expectations are. So these are some rubrics from some of my colleagues where they give exact uh, expectations for different point levels. And my colleague next door who's presenting, Maria Luisa, and I have dietetics colleagues, they make students score themselves on the rubric, if for no other reason because then the students actually read the rubric. But that self-assessment helps them. They can then go back and revise before they submit it after self-assessing using the rubric. So you can decide what are the things that you really want to value, and your rubric will communicate that to students. Um, this is another example. Obviously, point values are going to vary, and this is one that I developed for our teacher work sample. So these are just some references. It's not exhaustive by any means. Any questions? We only have like 30 seconds. 
Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, it was an amazing workshop. Um, just a concern, like uh, while you're talking, you said uh, when you put right an example, it takes away the cognitive load from the student. That's very good. But on the other way, I'm thinking that uh, one of the learning outcomes is a uh, cognitive development. Mm -hmm. So when you give them a writing example and that lessen the cognitive load, in a way, does that not counteract the main purpose of learning? I think there's still a cognitive development that occurs, but instead of having to go from here to here, they're going from here to here. So we are managing the cognitive load. We are still expecting development, but we're not overwhelming them. So many students, if there is no scaffolding, will shut down, or they'll resort to plagiarism. This is one of the things that happens. Or, and I meant to say this earlier, uh, Kendall was talking about the use of templates. If we don't provide templates or models, they will go look for them. And they might find ones that you don't want them to use. So th there's so many resources out there that they will go find. And it was one of the reasons that I wanted to study writing is because I was sometimes not tempted, but I worried that I was plagiarizing because there was so much content I was trying to understand at the same time that I was trying to write about it. So if we can take one piece of that and give them support so that they can have the lift that they need to feel successful, then the next time they get less support. So we take it away so that by the end of the experience, we are expecting that full cognitive uh, engagement with the task. I hope that helps. Thank you so much. Thank you.